Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. My name is Tyla, and I am a recovered alcoholic. And my God-given sobriety date is December 26, 1989. I just celebrated a couple weeks ago, 31 years, by the grace of God in this beautiful program and a lot of hard work. (laughs) Um, I'm so honored to be here. I I just am, I was so emotional this morning and um, I, I, that uh, I just was in tears, and that is not usually how I am, but I just was so moved by being able to have this opportunity to be here and share with you, and I want to honor all the people from the Bronx group that put these meetings on. You know, a lot of us just go on and listen, and we don't really know what it takes to put this on, and the commitment that they all give is tremendous, and the Bronx night meeting is one of the, to me, the best formats I've ever heard. I absolutely love the group, and I and I, I don't know exactly who puts this one on. I know Matt, and I know Olis, and I know a few of you, and I'm just so honored you for all the dedication to helping us during this difficult time, because I can't imagine if we didn't have Zoom at this time and we had COVID before Zoom was around, how difficult it could be for us. So I'm going to share with you um, how I developed my relationship with God through my story. It says in my own words, in my own language, and and really I developed it through the 12 steps. But I want to share with you a little bit of my background, how I got to the program. Um, uh, I'm from, I, uh, I'm from L.A. Uh, I designed clothes for 18 years in L.A. and lived overseas. I had a very, very successful career in designing clothes. I have, I have been an alcoholic from the minute I started drinking, and I started drinking around 18. And I saw at that young age loss of control. But I, of course, didn't know what it was. And when you're young, who gives a damn? You know, I didn't, I knew that I lost control, but I didn't know that every time I drank, I lost control because I didn't pay any attention to it because I could party and I could live through the hangovers and I could do it. So I, I, I came back to LA after I was in college in Missouri and um, I designed clothes and uh, my uh, drinking and other things that I did to go with it. I did a lot of drugs and my drinking just went on on and I I had a lot I had a job that I could do what I wanted when you design clothes it's not like I'm a bank manager when you design clothes they don't care what you do so I could show up you know under the influence of alcohol and no one cared as long as I the lines I was doing were successful not lines of cocaine I mean clothing lines were successful then they they were happy and uh, and I, I, I loved my life. I, uh, at 19, I got in a relationship with an undercover uh, narcotics guy and was with him for 11 years. It was a very dangerous, crazy relationship. He tried to kill me four times. I mean, he was very wonderful. It was just when I tried to leave. Then he would try to kill me if, if I left. I couldn't leave. So it was, it was he, but he was very good to me. I mean, he never hit me, none of that. But I used to say, well, he didn't hit me. But, you know, it was a very, very threatening, emotionally abusive relationship because I was terrified of the guy. So anyway, I finally got, my life went on and it was, I was about, and everything was good. It seemed good. And then um, uh, my alcoholism got worse and worse. And around 30, I went into a semi-treatment outpatient kind of semi-treatment. And then I took a job. I wanted to get out of LA and I took a job in Bangkok, Thailand. So I lived overseas for a, 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 long, a couple of years. I lived overseas designing in Thailand, India, and Hong Kong. And um, uh, it was crazy. It was a crazy lifestyle over there. It was difficult, but I finally came back. And after I came back, you know, my alcoholism was so bad that I could no longer hold a job. And from that point on, from about 33, I got uh, sober at 42. From that time on, I just kept hitting, hitting, hitting bottom. Everything got worse. Like, you know, the, it says on the top of 18, the destruction of everything worthwhile in life. Everything worthwhile in life at that point was almost already gone. You know what I'm saying? I, I, 
family I didn't see, um, friends, friends would get away from me because they would tell me I was out of control, you know, and I would tell them they're out of control and everything worthwhile in life was gone. And uh, I'm going to go to right before I got sober. I lost everything. I was, uh, I had been a call girl. I was, I was, had two Johns that were taking care of me. I was living in hotels. This is not fancy living. I was a call girl at the Beverly Hills Hotel, but this is in the streets of Pomona. And I don't know if you know the streets of Pomona. It's a really rough area in LA. And uh, I had two Johns that were taking care of me. And one of them said to me, you know, Tyla, I have this drug and alcohol counselor that works for me. And I want you to see him. And I thought, hmm. I don't have a problem. You guys, denial is so huge. I couldn't, I mean, I was so sick. If I, I weigh 140 pounds and then I weighed 95 pounds and I thought I was hot. I thought, and, and I was so sick spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally. I was sick in every beat part of my being. And Finally, he kept bugging me about this guy. Finally, I said, okay, I'll see the guy. Okay, I'll see him. So the guy was going to come to my hotel room. I was living at a Howard Johnson's off the 10 freeway and Indian Hill Boulevard in Pomona. And he was coming to see me at two o'clock on this day. And I, I, I was sitting in the hotel room um, and I was alone and I had sliding glass doors and I was looking in the parking lot, looking to see when this guy was going to come. And I'm sitting there and I'm drinking vodka out of the bottle and I'm smoking crack. And that's where my life was. And I am plastered. I mean, I was plastered every day. It was just a matter of how much at what time of the day. So I see this guy walking up to my room. And this guy looks kind of sick. He looks kind of yellow. He doesn't look healthy himself, right? And he walks into my room that day and he says to me, hi, my name's John. And I'm an alcoholic and an addict. And I'm a drug and alcohol counselor. And I would like to talk to you. And I said, listen, you can talk to me but I'm smoking crack and I'm drinking vodka. And you know what he said to me? He said, it's okay. You smoke it up and you drink it up and you let me talk to you. Well, I don't know what that says about never seeing anyone under the influence because that guy, he at, felt that God guided him to talk to me at that time and that's why he was there. And that guy talked to me for two hours and I, he told me, I re, what I remember he told me, that he told me a story, but what I remember is that he told me, I have 12 tools and I'll give you a tool a month and you'll never have to go back to this way of life again. Uh, your life will be different. I have a way to show you that. So after two hours, at the end of two hours, excuse me, he, he wrote down his name on a piece of paper and he handed it to me. And he said, if you ever get sick of dying, give me a call. And I thought, man, this guy is a little dramatic. What the heck? You know, but you know what? After he left, every time I was drinking and partying, I could hear him in my head. You know, it says in, Bill wrote that what comes from the heart enters the heart. And I could hear this guy coming inside of me. I would be drinking and I would hear him. You never have to live this way. I got 12 tools. It was like he was stuck inside of me. And I would go and I would, okay, I'm going to call him. So I'd go call him and I'd say, hi, John. And he'd say, what do you want? And I'd say, well, I just want to talk. He says, are you done? I said, well, he said, don't call me till you're done. Boom. And he hang up the phone. Man, this guy was tough, you guys. And see, I knew nothing. I knew nothing about a 12-step program in my life. I remember when I was in that outpatient program at 30 years old in Century City in LA, I remember the psychiatrist there telling me about these meetings. But I thought, I thought I was different. I never even knew. I didn't even know about recovery. I don't need meetings. You know what I mean? I just need, I just need a, a little help to manage my drinking and using. I don't need meetings. And so this is about three months after uh, he 12-stepped me, and it was uh, Christmas Eve day, 
and um, I was I was alone, and I had been I had a lot of fantasies about committing suicide, all kinds of different ways, you know. And this is not a new story. You newcomers that are here, welcome, welcome, welcome. And let me tell you, what God has done in my life, He will do in your life. I am not different. I'm, we're all special, but I am not different. He, if you work this program, God will do for you what you can't do for yourself, and He'll do more for you than you can do for yourself. And that's been my experience. And that day, uh, I always packed guns since I was with that undercover guy because we had so many death threats. I always had carried guns. So I, the last book I read was Cyber Cybernetics by L. Ron Hubbard. I thought that book would save me. And after I read that book, I said, I'm going to blow my brains out. And I was very, very drunk, very, very high. And I went in the bathroom of that motel room in Howard Johnson's and I put a gun to my head and I just prayed and I prayed and prayed, please, God, give me the courage. And I heard a voice speak to me. And you guys, it's like it was today. I heard a voice speak to me and that voice said, because I couldn't pull the trigger, that voice said, your life is being spared. Because it wasn't in words, it was like in a feeling inside of me. Your life is being spared so you can help other suffering men and women, alcoholics and addicts. And I, I didn't even think anything of it. I, I mean, I didn't really think anything of, of, of it until I thought I just couldn't go. It was like three or four in the morning. So I went to bed. And I woke up the next morning, and this is December 26, and I woke up the next morning, and it was a misty morning, and I walked outside my motel room, and I'm telling you, I was completely different. It was like I went to bed one person and woke up another, and I was, I, I couldn't believe it, you guys. To this day, I could tell you, I stood there and I thought, what, what has happened to me? I had no desire to pick up anything. No desire to pick up alcohol, no desire to do anything. I was, and I went in and called John and told him what happened. And he, he wasn't surprised at all. He said, oh, it's in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. It's in Bill's story. You know, what happened to you is real. And it was real. But that in itself would not have been enough to give me the kind of recovery that I have today. I, but it was enough that my life was completely changed. And from that point, I have never, ever had the obsession to pick up or to drink ever again. But I had to go through because, you know, from, we all have a spiritual experience. When we turn to walk into this program and we want to live instead of die, that's a spiritual experience that I could not create on my own. That's a spiritual experience by the grace of God. So I, I had that experience and then walking into the rooms and beginning a life in recovery, beginning to live the 12 steps, beginning this beautiful path of life. And, you know, John was my sponsor. He was my sponsor for eight years. And, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't know how sick he was that day. He 12 stepped me. He was a double kidney transplant patient. Remember I said he looked kind of yellow and sickly. He didn't tell me when he came to talk to me that he was, he was without a kidney that day. And he was not too sick to come in 12 step me and to offer me a new way of life and i always remember that when i'm working with others because of what he did for me and he was my sponsor for eight years and he taught me how to live through the 12 steps of the big book alcoholics anonymous i spent a lot of time in the hospital with him and my life went on and i just want to give you a brief rundown to get to where so i want to share some of the highlights that happened in my journey that have so given me that deep relationship with God. And so I was doing everything the program said. I was working with a lot of people. I did uh, Vista Jail for 10 years. I did County Detox every Sunday for 10 years, which is a, because I was going to where the people were that were like me. I didn't get clean and sober in a fancy house in Rancho Santa Fe. I came off the streets. So I went to where the street people were because my message was uniquely unique I was uniquely qualified for them not that I can't share with anyone but I wanted to carry it to the people that were so like me so I did I did uh, 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 county detox for 10 years every Sunday I was sponsored I did everything I, I I did the 12 steps I was doing step four when I was in enough pain I was living in 10 11 and 12 you know I was kind of doing prayer and meditation not as much as I really needed to and so about 12 years sober, I hit, and I, I didn't know what this was. I hit what they call a sober bottom. You guys have probably heard of it. Uh, uh, you know, dry drunk, unmanageability, 
you know, um, spiritual malady. I, I didn't know what it was called, but I hit this place and I was in my house and I hit this place where I wanted to blow my brains out. I wouldn't do it, but I said, I can't live anymore with what's going on inside of me. And I told people, I told people in the program, you don't understand, I'm really sick. Something's going on inside of me. And they would tell me, oh, this too will pass. You're gonna be okay, just pray on it. Bullshit, I was gonna pass. I was really messed up. And they didn't, no one was acknowledging it because you know what? No one in the crew that I was with in San Diego, that the, the, the idea of recovery was do the 12 steps once, live in 10, 11, and 12, and do a four step when you need to. That's what they was going around, and it wasn't working for me. And maybe it works for them, that's fine. But it, I, and I didn't know what wasn't working because I was the walking dead. You can be, you can, you can be die an alcoholic death in sobriety without dying. You can die spiritually till you're the walking dead, and that was me. And the next day, I sat in my room and thinking, I can't believe I wanna kill myself again. And I'm not being dramatic. I wouldn't have done it, but that's the way I felt, you know? And uh, uh, the next day, someone I sponsor, she goes, oh, I know you love to listen to CDs, and I know you love to listen to talks, because I did. I still do. I love to listen to speakers that inspire me and take me further and show me the possibilities that I may not see. And she handed me a set of, I think it was cassettes, a set of cassettes. And she said to me, uh, I know you love to listen to speaker things. I want you to listen. This guy is really good. And I, so I got in my car and I put it in and it was, I swear to you, I had never heard of this guy in my life. It was Mark Houston. It was the glass house. It was a six set CD of the CDs on the 12 steps. You guys, I thought God was speaking to me right out of my radio. I had never heard anything like that. I'd never heard recovery like that in my life. I was flipped. And I listened to Mark so much on that that I probably had the whole thing memorized. I was so excited because I had hope. I had hope. I heard something I'd never heard. These, he was doing all 12 steps every couple of years. This guy was living a different way through the 12 steps. And I, I was so excited. So I got a hold of Mark in Texas and I flew him out to San Diego to stay with me, to teach me what he was doing. Now, I didn't even know Mark was a big speaker. I'd never heard of Mark in my life. I didn't, you know what I mean? And I, I, so he came out here and I wanted him to take me through the big book and show me the way that he did the steps so that I could have what he had. And we had talked for about a month or a month and a half on the phone before he came out. He sent me an unmanageability exercise. He sent me a tornado exercise. He showed me a, a, a present day agnosticism exercise, all these things that I'd never heard of. I didn't even understand that the second half of step one, the unmanageability was inside. I thought it was outside. And all these things that I began to see that I had never experienced or understood. And I began to wake up because I had been asleep. I had fallen asleep. We can fall asleep. I had fallen asleep and I began to wake up. And Mark came out here and Mark brought with him. Now, I didn't know what Mark, I just thought he was going to bring his big book. Mark brought with him the big book Awakening and the Idiot's Guide. And he took me through that. And he showed me how to do that work. And I worked with him for five years. And my life so infinitely changed. And there were some of the things. When Mark stayed with me, I saw him do meditation like I never saw anyone do meditation. I, he was absolutely disciplined every morning to do an hour of prayer and meditation and spiritual disciplines. You guys, I didn't do them. Today, I do them. And, you know, I had to go back through the steps with him and with other people that I started to work with after that to understand what this relationship with God is about, understand what, what I, why I need it, the depth of to why I need it, right, and to understand what the book is offering me. See, I knew that I had the physical craving. I knew that I was powerless physically. I didn't have any doubt. I'd had a spiritual awakening. There was no doubt in it, but I had to go through the book and lay my experience next to the book. I knew I had a mental obsession. I knew I couldn't control the stop. I knew I couldn't keep myself stopped. I knew, believe me, that I'm not a hard drinker. A hard drinker has sufficient reason they can stop and moderate. I drink over what they stop and moderate over. I'm not a hard drinker. I knew that. But if I don't understand and have an experience with the big book to the depth of which my problem is, I am not, I'm going to seek God 
I believe, to the same depth that I have an experience with step one. Because these guys were telling me out of Denver, these guys were telling me that everything that I do in the 12 steps is based on my first step. Not Step seven is not based on step six. If I don't do a good step seven, it's because I don't get to drink us to die. Everything I'm unwilling to do in the 12 steps is based on step one. And I didn't know that. So I started going through step one in a deep and effective way through the big book. But when I got to the unmanageability, <clears throat> I got, and I had a relationship with God from the beginning, I thought. But the problem was my relationship with God was abstract when I first worked with Mark. I never knew that I could have a personal, Bill talks in the second half of Bill's story about a personal relationship with God. I never knew I could have a personal relationship with God, that there was a God that really cared about me and wanted a relationship with me. I never knew that. So when I looked at the second half of the first step, the unmanageability and saw that I had to find a spiritual basis of life or else. And I say today, today, I'm just starting to, I'm going to start going through the work February 16th, uh, in a workshop I'm doing, I'm going to start going through the work again, because I do all 12 steps in a deep and effective way every couple of years, I, because I know that I need to renew my commitment to God. And every time I go through the 12 steps, I grow spiritually. And I don't know what God's going to bring me because I do the set aside prayer and I don't know what God's going to bring me, but I know that my life will be infinitely changed and I will have more freedom, more peace, more understanding. It may be painful, but whatever I have to go through, God will see me through it. So when I look at that, that, that second half of step one and see alcoholic death, spiritual way of life, and like I say, that death may not be in the ground. How am I doing? Where am I agnostic in my life? Where am I not bringing God into every area of my life? Is lack of power my dilemma? Sometimes it's not my dilemma, but do I need more power today in my life and how much time I have? Do I have all the power? If I'm not going to grow spiritually, I'm going to drink. This is all about growing spiritually. It's getting a relationship with God and growing spiritually. So I look at those bedevilments on page 52, which is a reflection of my internal condition. Those bedevilments give me a temperature gauge of my internal condition. They are not, they are not the spiritual malady. I, the spiritual malady is a disorder. I have a spiritual disorder inside of me. I play God. I stand in the place of God. And when I'm trying to manage my life, and especially this internal part, it gets into a disorder because I can't manage it. And the bedevilments, am I full of fear? Today in my life, I have fear. My fear isn't like it used to be, but I have it today. Fear doesn't carry me like it used to. It used to drive me. Fear, you, you know, Mark says, you know, you get up in the morning and you strap a rocket on your back and you are driven everywhere you go, zoom, 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 right? And that was me zooming around, not even knowing, thinking I'm making decisions and choices in my life when I'm not because I'm so driven by fear. I think I was one of the most fear-based people that I ever have worked, been with or worked with in this program. And I've worked with a lot of people because I just, I don't know why, but through doing these practices, you know, fear has slowly gotten less and less and less. It says, can I be of real help to other people? And so then I get a chance to examine how am I doing and working with others? Is it effective? Not is it good, is it bad, is it effective, is it working? How am I, every time I work with someone, I need to ask, how's it working, right? Can I control my emotional nature? Am I, am I having trouble in personal relationships? And so I write down the 10 most important relationships in my life. And you know what? God's never on it. The most important relationship in my life is God. And Pat T, who's on this line, and I are in a big book group right now with some a strong big some strong big book people and we were looking at that and I never wrote down God isn't that the most important relationship in my life so I write down those relationships and I look at them I'm having trouble in them why thank you Chris I'm watching Chris <laughs> so um I'm having trouble in personal relationships my trouble in personal relationships are to me because I need too much from them you see one person doesn't love me enough. One person loves me too much. I try to get from people what only God can give me. And that's where my trouble is. I worship the relationships I'm in. And I like to look at where am I dishonest in these relationships? How's my emotional nature in this relationship? It says I can't control my emotional nature. My emotional nature, my emotional 
Anytime the big book says nature, it means inside of me. My emotions are outside, the things you may see, but what you don't see is what's inside of me. My discontent, my fear, how upset I am, all the struggles, you know what I'm saying? It's the way I experience life. So this disorder that I have inside of me, the disorder is spiritual misery, spiritual malady. It says on page 64, when the spiritual malady is overcome, I straighten out mentally and physically. So if the spiritual malady is not overcome, I don't straighten out mentally and physically. And that's where I was at 12 years. The spiritual malady hadn't been overcome. I didn't even know what it was. I didn't even know what the unmanageability was. I never looked at the bedevilments once. And I'm sharing this with you because I hope if you ever get in that place or in that place right now, that you begin to have an understanding of where you're at and you don't have to live there anymore because there's a way out of this. And I've never been there. I mean, not that I haven't been in the, in the bedevilments I have because the spiritual life is not a straight line. I am going to veer off. But I have never stayed in those bedevilments long enough to ever get to the place that I was. Because if those bedevilments get out of whack long enough, it can, it can set up a situation inside of me that insanity can return. And when insanity returns, I could drink again. And believe me, insanity comes before the first drink. That's what it tells us more about alcoholism. I do crazy stuff when I drink. But that is not, that is not the insanity. Because I, there's people, there's these rich women that live right near me in Rancho Santa Fe. It's a real rich area. There's all these rich women up there. And so if I'm going to say that the, I'm gonna, if I'm going to say that the circumstance and the result of my drinking is what makes it insane, because I go to jail, I end up on the streets, I do prostitution, whatever it is, right? That's the insanity of alcoholism. No, that's the result of alcoholism. The insanity of alcoholism comes before the first drink. And if I'm going to 12-step that woman up in Rancho Santa Fe and talk to her, she's an alcoholic, she takes oxycodone, she's never left her house, and she doesn't have one negative circumstance. How am I going to talk to her about the insanity of alcoholism if I don't understand it comes before the first drink? It's an idea that outweighs all other ideas why I shouldn't. And I don't have the power to change it. So I'm beginning to see not only the powerlessness physically in the in the craving that i can't control the amount and the insanity of that is that i think i can control control the amount the i'm see i'm seeing the powerlessness in the in the mental obsession that i cannot control the stop i cannot stay stopped on my own power and the insanity is i think that i can and the and the and the insanity of the unmanageability of my spirit is that i can think i can self-will spiritual growth i think i can fix me and the, no way can I, and until I went through the book in a deep and effective way, laying my experience next to it, turning statements into questions, asking myself these things, how is your emotional nature, right? Until I went through and looked at these things, I didn't have the deep experience I needed because those bedevilments give me a reflection of my internal condition when fit and when unfit. And remember, step 10 is going to talk about fit spiritual condition, so it can't talk about fit unless there's unfit. And so I can look at when I'm whacked out in those areas and what do I do? You may be guided to do different things than I do. Usually for me, I have to step back a little bit and get a little more prayer and meditation because that is how I build my relationship with God. So I look at that unmanageability and then I go through the agnostics to see how I'm doing today. Am I seeking? Am I seeking? Because it says on the bottom 46, I need to seek. If I don't seek, I'm excluded from this. I need to seek and I need to ask myself particular questions. Do, do I believe that God can take me further in every area of my life? And that's a consideration on page 47. Do I believe that today? Yes. Not only do I believe it, I've experienced it. It's absolutely true. And then I look at the other second consideration that God's everything or God's nothing. Either God is everything or I'm everything. What does that mean? What does that mean to me? To me, God's everything means that God is everything to me. God will give me all the direction, all the strength, all the courage, all the insight, all the comfort. God will give me what I need, not the material stuff. And he may give me that too, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm, this is a spiritual way of life. And I'm looking for the power to help me have that spiritual life. Not only will he will give me the power to go through the difficulties I need to go through. They may not be, always be removed, but he'll give me the power to go through them. So I consider that. Is God still everything to me or is he nothing? Because if God's nothing, then I'm everything. 
and I know that I cannot create a spiritual life on my own. And a spiritual life is completely dependent on my relationship with God. So I go and I take, I go on into that third step. And you know, I take that third step. I've taken it many times. I take that third step, looking at the considerations, being the actor, being the director. Am I creating confusion on my own power? Am I still driven by a hundred forms of fear? Page 62. Am I today? Yes, I can be at times, but it's a beautiful description of what I'm going to see in the fourth step, driven by a hundred forms of fear, selfishness, self-seeking, and self-delusion. I step on the toes of my fellows, and they retaliate, column two, seemingly without provocation. I did nothing. See, at this point, Especially if you're new, I did nothing. I know better than that. I know I did something because I've done enough four steps. And they retaliate seemingly without provocation, but I invariably find as I do a four step that I made decisions based on self, which put me in a position to be hurt. You see, before I did the work with Mark Houston and Dan Sherman, I worked with 14 years. Before I did the work this way, I never, if, if I don't do a four step that proves that paragraph, that paragraph will set me free. If I don't do a four step that will prove that, I will never get what the book promises. See, it, then it says, my troubles are my own making. That's the greatest statement of hope in the big book. Because if my troubles are of your making, I will never be free. Because I have no power to change you. And if, when I see in, through inventory, that's been one of my difficulties, trying to change you. My troubles are of my own making. They arise out of me, the big book says. That means they come from me. And if I don't do a four-step that shows me my troubles are my own making and they arise out of me, and that I make decisions based on self, which put me in a position to be hurt, maybe I can begin to make decisions based on God that do not put me in a position to be hurt. And I go down there, and the decision is, I have to quit playing God. Why? Playing God did not work. Too simple? Yeah, but that's the truth. Playing God did not work. And I may not see it if you're new until you go through that fourth step and see that it doesn't work. And I've done many, like I said, third steps, and I have never taken that third step back. If you're still taking that third step back, you've never taken a third step. It doesn't mean I won't get into self-will. This is not, spiritual life's not a straight line. It doesn't mean I won't get into step with, uh, in, into self-will. I will. But I've never taken that decision back. But I've confirmed it again many times as I go through the work. And when I go through that fourth step of resentment inventory, and I want to talk about this, what I saw that drove me. Because if I don't see the depth to which I need God, why will I seek God? And when I go through that resentment inventory and I write the, the uh, third column, in the third column, I'm going to see how I play God. In those seven areas of self, that is my play. And sometimes I write God, Tyler playing God, because that's what I'm doing. It's how I want you to see me, how I want you to act towards me, how I want this relationship to be. It's, and I write the fear next to it. And all that fear drives the false notions of how I need the world to be around me for me to be okay. And see, if you don't do what I need, the world is a very difficult place to live because I'm looking to you to give me what only God can give me. I'm looking for you to give me perfect love, perfect acceptance, perfect understanding. You cannot do it. But until I write it out in that third column and see it, I don't understand. Because see, when I gave, I saw in the third step too, that when I first did the work with Mark, that Mark said to me, let's look at your present day agnosticism. I didn't even know what it meant. I thought that was just such a lofty word. I said, I don't have any. Mark said, oh, yes, you do. So looking at my present day agnosticism is where I leave God out. Agnostics believe there's a God, but don't believe God will work personal in their lives. I did not. There are areas that I, I didn't. I only gave God my alcoholism and my addiction. Everything else I managed. And until I did the work through the big book in a deep and effective way, I never saw that. Uh, my finances, and this is what I saw. This is how, why you write inventory. My finances, this is what I thought deep inside of me. Well, you know, I'm smart with money. I can handle my finances. Why do I need to ask God, right? And my sex life, I, can ha I don't have any 
history that I can handle my sex life or intimate relationships, but I thought I could. I thought, why would I bother God with that? He's done so much for me. I didn't know that there was this thinking deep inside of me until I inv inventoried it. So the, this is places that God was not in my life. God wants to be in every area of my life. So as I look at that third column and I see how I play God and the fear that drives it. So if that fear is removed from that third column, I have a chance to reach a place of neutrality because fear drives it, as it said in that paragraph on page 62. And then I look at that fourth column, where was I to blame? Where were my mistakes? Not my part. Nowhere does it say my part, because if I have a part, you have a part. Where were my mistakes? Where was I to blame? I begin as, we, as a way that we lay it out, I begin to see how my fear the deepest part of who I am drives a delusion, which results in selfish thinking, which results in selfish, self-seeking behavior. And the fear and the delusion is the deepest part of who I am. And it says on page 72 in the big book, when we go into step five, it talks about my defects and it talks about the nature of my defects. The nature of my defects is what drives my defects of character. And the nature is the fear and delusion and there's no working on it. There's only an act of God in that area. I have to admit what's subjectionable from a six step perspective. When I'm fifth stepping, I'm looking at what's subjectionable so that I can take it to God. So when I'm doing that, I'm looking at, can I remove the delusion? Can I remove the fear? And that fear is the deepest part of who I am that drives everything in my life. That fear and underneath the fear, to me, whatever the fear is, what I've seen with lots of people and myself, the fear is I'm alone in the world. There's no one to help me and I'm gonna fail here. And that is the be deepest delusion that drives all my other fears. And those fears set up my life. They set up a train of circumstances which I thought I didn't deserve. But thank God this is not about, thank God that this is about mercy and not justice. The mercy of God. And I look, as I look at that, I, as I look at that inventory and resentment, and I look at the bottom of page 66 where it says, this is the key to our future. The key to my future is to master resentments or else they'll master me. And the key to my future is to begin to see that person who wronged me in column one, that they're sick like me, they're broken like me. And what we do, the group I'm with, is what we do is we write, whatever I resent you did to me, I write how I did it to you or others. So I begin to see that we're alike and not different. Not when it's child sex abuse or something, that's different. But I begin to see you're sick like me and I'm sick like you. And I begin to operate every one of those, every one of those inventories will take me to a prayer. And I wanna read this to you because it's taking me to a relationship with God. To view those who harm me as spiritually sick, to see that the reason for my fears is that I believe I have only myself to rely on. And to realize my selfishness is the cause of my sex problems are the new attitudes I have been trying to experience through inventory. Each part of inventory takes me to the prayer, takes me to a prayer, prayer to God. For resentment, I pray to be released from the control anger has on me. For fear, I ask God to remove it and direct my attention to who he would have me be. For sex problems, I ask God to mold my ideals and give me the strength to live up to them to direct me about each situation. These practical prayers are the beginning of a new relationship with God. When my ideals are grounded in a power greater than myself, my life will be recreated. That's from the doctor's opinion. Isn't that beautiful? I see every single one of those inventories takes me to prayer, takes me to a deeper relationship with God. I go through that fifth step. And as I go through that fifth step, and I do, uh, I finish it and I go through those beautiful promises on page 75. And then I go from steps, I take it the way we do it. There's lots of ways to do it. No ways are wrong. This is just the way we do it. When I go into step six, I go into a meditation and I picturing everyone in front of me. I have all my inventory in front of me, all my resentment. I pick up the first resentment inventory and let's say that it is to my brother. I look at, I glance at it, I put it down and I picture my brother in front of me. And I 
look at what happened between us. And I asked myself, am I willing to let go of this and put it in God's hands? Am I willing to let go of this? Am I willing to forgive? When I do fifth steps, when I do fifth steps, I bring forgiveness in and I'm gonna tell you why. And this has only been recently and I wanna share it with you because it's been so effective and powerful. It says on the bottom of 75, when we make amends, that we go to them in a helpful and forgiving spirit. How do I go to them in a forgiving spirit if I haven't considered or tried to walk towards the direction of forgiveness? And forgiveness has become a huge part of my recovery as I've worked with Jose G for the last four years, uh, who's in the program and he is my spiritual advisor and he has taken me so much deeper in forgiveness because I, I wanted and when I'm hearing fifth steps and not like I said not childhood abuse but when I'm hearing fifth steps I ask them what's objectionable and at the end of this I ask them are you willing to forgive are you willing to cancel the debt because you may say oh yeah I'm willing to forgive but you haven't canceled the debt and I know from my experience that when I'm willing to forgive that God will carry me and forgiveness is the absolute deepest freedom that I can have because I have had to write inventory six times on some people before I got into forgiveness because I would say, oh, I let go. I put it in God's hands. I did step seven, but it was still there until I, what I, I did is I started going on the internet and researching forgiveness prayers. When I had a resentment to someone and I did an inventory, before I went to step seven, I started doing all these prayers on forgiveness, hoping that God would move my heart to forgiveness. And this happened like five years ago. So now it has become a working part of my everyday life. When I say love and tolerance of others is my code, I say love, tolerance, and forgiveness is my code because I want forgiveness to be a working part of my everyday life. I want it to be a working part of 10. I want it to be a working part of 11. I want it to be a working part of the way that I live my life because forgiveness is love in action. And I need that in my life. So when I finish that meditation in step six, looking at every person, seeing if there's anything I'm clinging to, seeing that I'm ready to put this all in God's hands, then I do that seven step prayer, my creator. You see, I want God to touch the nature of my defects, not just my defects. And the nature, the fear and the delusion that drives my life and only that which created my nature can change my nature and he is my creator. And I don't know what God's gonna remove in step seven, but I know that he's gonna remove the things. My creator, I'm now willing you should follow me good and bad. See, I don't know the difference between good and bad. Please remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. See, a lot of things he doesn't take away have been useful. Lots of things. My alcoholism is not taken away and it's been useful to helping a lot of people. So I walk, go into step eight, make the list. I go into nine, my, but it says that my real purpose is to fit up myself to be of maximum service to God and my fellows. And walking, to, if I, step nine takes everything that I've done from one through seven and I walk it out in my life. I walk hand in hand with God doing it. And I've done a lot of amends. I finished all my amends I'm consciously aware of. And that was another problem at 12 years. I had not finished all of my amends. I finished the amends I wanted to finish, but not all of them. And these guys were very hard on finishing amends. You know, I went to meet with a woman that I had an affair with her husband. I'm not gonna go into the details. It was one of the, my hardest amends. But I know that when those amends are, are finished, there's a different relationship with God. The channel is clear because the channel gets cleared all along the steps. And as I finish my ninth step and complete my amends, the channel to God that I need to keep clear in step 10 and 11 and 12 is it is clear. Because when I go into step 10, I've entered the world of the spirit. What does that mean to me? And the world of the spirit means to me that I have a relationship with God that I can carry out into every area of my life. That I can have a depth inside of me. See, when the way... Back to the spiritual malady for a minute. When, when, when the way I experience the world inside of me changes, my whole world changes, I can be okay even when life is not okay. And I never got that. 
Because if life wasn't okay, I couldn't be okay. And I got that at the deepest part of who I am, that life can be chaotic, life can be difficult, but I can be okay. So I look, I've entered the world of the spirit and my next function is grow in understanding, understanding of God's will and effectiveness of carrying God, God's will out into my life. Alignment of the will, step 10. Step 10 is the way I go through my day. It gives me, this is a way of living that I never ever dreamt I could have. A way of living with reliance on God that absolutely is life changing. And as I go through my day, step 10 is the way I go through my day and step 11 is, is the way I end my day and open my day. But I go through step 10 and I have an opportunity going through step 10. I have an opportunity every time I'm doing something during the, this is automatic now because I've doing, done it a long time. I, meditation for me is God directed thought. And I do that all day long, all day long. God direct my thinking, God direct my thinking. And but every time I do an activity during the day and I turn from it, I'm looking, I'm watching. Did I hurt anyone? Do I owe an amends? How did I handle it? Was I, it okay? Was I loving and tolerant, right? Um, I, did I, I, I quit fighting everything and any, everyone, even alcohol. Ba greatest promises in the big book are the promises on the top of page 85. The promises, the problem has been removed. It does not exist. That is unbelievable to me that the problem's been removed and has been removed. The mental obsession, the physical craving has been removed, but the spiritual malady has not. The spiritual malady is overcome. I am recovered mentally and physically, but I will always be recovering spiritually. I'm recovered and recovering in the spiritual side of the circle and triangle, in the spiritual malady, in the bedevilments. My, my life is dependent on my spiritual growth because if I... The disease is growing, and I better outgrow it. And as I grow spiritually with God, my life gets better and better. So I look at that nightly review, and that's how I, I live my life. Is through, I read 84 through 88 every day. I do it in different ways so that it makes it less repetitive. But I've read it every day for like 15 years. Now I may do a paragraph one day, and I may go through it a paragraph at a time. My spiritual practices in the morning are an hour and a half. And um, uh, I do my nightly review looking. The nightly review is I'm looking for where things I missed, where I might have done something that I didn't pick up in step 10. That's why the nightly review is first. It is a constructive nightly review, not a destructive. Where was I selfish, dishonest, resentful, or afraid? Right? I look at that. I can't say that I wasn't selfish and dishonest and resentful and afraid if I haven't finished all my amends. Until I finished, I can't. So then it takes me, I look at that nightly review, and if I'm doing a destructive nightly review, then I will be in morbid reflection. Because it's what could I have done better? That's one of the greatest spiritual questions that I know. What could I have done better? God's not beating me up, so why am I beating myself up? God's saying to me, look, you know, when I look at a situation that happened during the day, how can I see that I could have done it better? Even though I may not owe an amends, I'm going to grow spiritually by healthy, God-directed self-reflection. And then if there's any amends to make, or even if there isn't, I will ask God what corrective measures should be taken. You know, God, I've been seeing that I have been really uh, greedy and demanding and over-talking people, and I've seen this, and God help me with that. Help me not, because prayer to me is the greatest gift. Prayer is life-changing. And I have, a, I have a notebook that I write letters to God every day. Part of my meditation practice is I write letters. Now, they're not long letters. They're on an eight by 10 notebook paper. There's probably two or three. They're, sm le they're, they're short, but these letters have built intimacy with God. And when I write difficulties I'm having in those letters, they get answered they get answered. I get answers. And I always open with dear God. And I always open with what I'm grateful for. Then I write things I'm struggling with, things I've seen in my 1011, things I need help with, decisions I may have to make in business or in other things. And then I always close with attributes that I need God to help me with, things that I've seen I'm struggling. Please, if I'm being over demanding and over this with people, please help me be more gentle, more kind, more understanding. A better listener, I may have, which I see that sometimes. I want to be a better listener. So I write and ask God to help me with the attributes that I need in my life. And he always does.
And as I go through my day, where it says going through the day, it says, it says that I can trust my thinking. My thought life will be placed on a much higher plane, right? I can begin to trust my thinking. So I don't understand these people that are in meetings and saying, my mind is a dangerous neighborhood. That's not what the big book says. I've had a deep and effective spiritual experience and I can trust my thinking when it's God directed. Because everything that I've done in my life, aligning my will with God's will, right? Everything I've done in my life has come from my five senses, right? Five senses. Hearing, especially in sex relationships, hearing whatever you told me that was, was you know, uh, complimentary and good about me, that always worked. Hearing, seeing, touching, tasting, and smelling. Touching got me in a lot of trouble. Seeing, oh, I see things I need. Oh, I need the new car. I need this. I need that, right? All the decisions I've made in my life come from those five senses. And the book promises me that I now can operate from sixth sense. God consciousness, God awareness, which, which is within each and every one of us. I begin to operate from a new plane. It says on the top of 55, we saw another kind of flight. We saw spiritual flight. We saw spiritual liberation. People that rose above their problems. We rise above, I rise above my problems because I begin to see them from the eyes of God. I begin to see them from a different perspective. I'm not seeing them from down here. I'm able to look and it, with, with the eyes of compassion. And as I go through 11, get off my knees and then I go work with others and working with others has been the greatest gift in my life to build my relationship with God because I begin to see people differently as I learn and experience the struggles that each of us have it says in we agnostics that outer appearances are not inner reality I begin to see that in the people I work with. I begin to understand the struggles they have. I begin to see people as my brothers and my sisters. I begin to walk hand in hand with the world in a different way. And my biggest job in sponsorship is to get them reliant on God and not reliant on myself. And I talk to that newcomer from the beginning about God because that's what it says in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It tells me, uh, and I'd like to just read this to you, Burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone. The only condition is that he trusts in God and clean house. Burn it. I don't know how you can get more power. I talk to new people from the beginning about a relationship with God with a higher power that they understand. They're starting that relationship right from the beginning. I'm not waiting. They can't afford to wait. But what happens is I begin to see the world a different way. Because I begin to understand the depth of to which people suffer. I begin to understand the depth of to which God will create miracles in your life. And this is the basis of my spiritual life, is working with others, hand in hand, with the wonderful, wonderful people that I have got to work with. And it is the, a joy, because I want to teach them. I want to teach them to be reliant on God from the beginning. I get, they call me with difficulties. I ask them to take it to prayer for three days and call me with the answer. What did they hear? We're going to discuss it, because their dependence must be on God. Not that I don't help them with difficulties. I can. I do. But as I go more and more through the 12 steps with them, I'm pushing them, pushing them to reliance on God, to this beautiful beautiful relationship that God has so freely given to me because I could never imagine in a million years that I could have a life that is so amazing and incredible like this. I mean, from the streets, from the gutters, from to being picked up like, like a little rag doll in the, in the hands of God and given this incredible life, I can't even imagine it. So um, I would like, I'm so honored, you guys, to be here with you. And I, I want to say a couple things and I'm going to read something and close out. If you notice, I have my phone number next to my name. You guys, we are at a very difficult time with COVID. People are suffering endlessly. I hope you'll all consider to put your name, phone number next to your name. How does a newcomer find us? A newcomer's on a meeting and they think, I just did this recently. Don't think I'm all the spiritual and I just did it in the last six months. A newcomer can come on a meeting, they can see someone they relate to, and they can take their phone number because we're not able to go up to them anymore. So that's been a tremendous help to how do I reach out to the newcomer in a way today through COVID that 
can we all reach out more to each other? Can we all have more patience? Can we all reach out? People are suffering tremendously right now through this. And I just ask, you know, that we all reach out and be a little more helpful in every way that we can, a little more patient, a little more kind, a little more understanding. It's a difficult time and God will see us through. We will overcome this. And I keep in prayer. I, keep, I pray for the fellowship. I pray for the nation. I pray for the world. Because God is a good God. Trust God and do good. And I want to read this. And I'm going to close out. Many voices ask for my attention. There is the voice that says, prove that you are a good person. Another voice says, you'd better be ashamed of yourself. There is also the voice that says, nobody really cares about you. And the one that says, be sure to become successful, popular, and powerful. But underneath all these often very noisy voices is a still, small voice that says, you are my beloved. My favor rests on you. That's the voice we need most of all to hear, the voice of our caring God. To hear that voice, however, requires special effort. It requires solitude, silence, and a strong determination to listen. That's what prayer is. It is listening to the voice that calls us my beloved. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.